Hello, my name is Sam Feltham. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration and welcome to the PHC Virtual Conference 2020. The coronavirus has changed all of our lives, but where there's an obstacle, there's also an opportunity. And that opportunity comes in the guise of this virtual conference. Earlier this year, we had to postpone our two main events, the annual conference and the Real Food Rocks Festival until next year. These events allow us to connect, learn and grow, but they also help us raise crucial funds for the PHC to continue. With that in mind, and before we let the next presenter speak, this virtual conference is 100% free for all. But if you find the content valuable today, then please consider donating £2 or whatever you can afford through the Total Giving website via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate. Or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world, and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation on the comments section here on YouTube or via the hashtag PHCVCon2020 on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for your support, take care and stay safe. Greetings from a lovely and sunny Hebden Bridge, West Yorkshire. Today I'm talking about whether we can obtain our essential nutrients from real food. As hypocrites said, let food be thy medicine and let thy medicine be thy food. When I refer to real foods, I'm talking about one ingredient foods that haven't been processed or fortified in any way. So what is an essential nutrient? Well, it's a nutrient in which an organism must obtain it from the environment or from food um, since we're unable to make it. So there are essential fats, essential proteins, essential vitamins, essential minerals and another um, substance called choline is also essential. So where's carbohydrate? Why isn't carbohydrate on this list? Well there's one really good reason and that's because carbohydrate is not an essential nutrient. If we don't eat carbohydrate we make it. And we make it by a process called gluconeogenesis. So for every gram of protein we eat, it's possible to convert about half of that into glucose. That means that if we eat 100 grams of protein, we can make 56 grams of glucose. And around 10% of fat can be converted into glucose. So if we eat 100 grams of fat, we can make 10 grams of glucose. So back in 2005, it was stated in the dietary reference intakes that the lower limit of dietary carbohydrate compatible with life is zero, provided that we consume adequate amounts of protein and fat. So here we are, the process of gluconeogenesis where we can convert triglycerides, which is fat, and amino acids from protein into glucose. Now Professor Tim Notes and his team have demonstrated that we've got the ability to convert or to make glucose at a rate of 6 grams to 25 grams per hour. So over a 24 hour period, we could, if we needed to, make 600 grams of glucose. That's a very, very high carbohydrate diet. Now, unfortunately, if people are very stressed or sleep deprived or they have very high levels of insulin resistance, then they might actually be making these high levels of glucose in the liver every day. And that's not good if people are wanting to control their weight. However, the good news is, is that we can make lifestyle changes to reduce that happening. 
So why am I advising to have the essential nutrients from real food rather than supplements? Well, the advantage of food is that it also contains many of the compounds called phytochemicals that work in synergy with the essential nutrients to allow them to do the body processes. Also, when we eat nutrients in real food, the nutrients together help to tell the hunger center in the brain that we're satisfied. So it creates a feeling of satiety, feeling of fullness. However, sometimes supplements need to be used, and that's when insufficient amounts are available through food, such as vitamin D, and also uh, in, when times of increased requirements, uh, such as folate in pregnancy, and perhaps even vitamin C at the moment with COVID-19. So let's start with fats. Now, fats... Um, um, there are essential nutrients in fats, but not all um, fats are essential to eat. Fats are building blocks of fatty acids. And so we have the fatty acids, three fatty acids joined up with a glycerol, glycerol backbone to form a triglyceride. There's three types of fats, saturated fatty acids, monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. And the difference between these three is whether they have double bonds or not. So fats or fatty acids are chains of carbons. And in saturated fats, all the carbons have been fully saturated with hydrogen. So there's no double bonds. In monounsaturated fats, then there's one so mono is one double bond. Extra virgin olive oil is a fantastic example of a monounsaturated fatty acid. There's one double bond, which could be a weak spot, but because the extra virgin olive oil contains polyphenols, which is an antioxidant, this allows the extra virgin olive oil to be very stable and less prone to oxidation. Then we've got the polyunsaturated fatty acids, and these have got multiple, two or more double bonds. So they're more prone to oxidation. Now, believe it or not, 90 to 95% of fat in the body is actually saturated or monounsaturated. So only 5 to 10% of the fat in the body is polyunsaturated. And as I've said already, the saturated fats and monounsaturated fats are more stable, less prone to oxidation. These aren't essential because we can make them. So we can make saturated fat and monounsaturated fat from glucose. And this process normally is carried out in the liver and is called de novo lipogenesis, which is the production called the production of new fat. So we can't make polyunsaturated fats so they become essential, but they're only needed in very, very small amounts. Only 1% of our energy intake should come from polyunsaturated fats. And their key role is for the construction of cell membranes and for signaling networks. So when we do take in the polyunsaturated fats, it's best to take it in them in with real food that also contain the main antioxidants such as vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, um, because that way, and also uh, selenium as well, because that way it prevents these fats from oxidizing. So the two essential polyunsaturated fats are omega-6 and omega-3. Omega-6 controls and regulates inflammatory responses. So it's key to responding to injury or damage. But excess can lead to chronic inflammation and therefore chronic diseases such as type 2 diabetes. Linoleic acid is the primary omega-6 fat. And it's converted to a highly unsaturated fatty acid to be active in the body. 
However, this conversion uses the same enzymes that are used to convert the omega-3 to its active components. So they compete for these enzymes. So the ratio between our intake of omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids is crucial. Back in the day when we only ate real foods, this ratio was one to one. The advice is now is that with the ratio is four to one or, or less. Refined vegetable oils are very detrimental because these provide the body with huge amounts of omega-6 and can get this important ratio unstable or unbalanced. So many people are consuming ratios between omega-6 and omega-3 of up to 20 to 1 or 30 to 1. And this really is going to put this body into a state of oxidized uh, cells. So the recommended daily value for the omega-6 is around 14 grams a day. That's only 14 grams a day. And two tablespoonfuls of walnuts would just about give us that requirement. Sunflower seeds are also a good source, as are free-range eggs. Omega-3, we need this for anti-inflammatory reasons, and also it can reduce blood levels of the triglycerides. The main fatty acid is the alpha-linoleic acid, and this is converted to the active components EPA and DHA. However, as I've already said, it competes with the enzymes in the omega-6 conversion. Now, when it is converted, it becomes the building blocks for the brain and also the nerve and eye cells. As the conversion isn't great, especially if people are consuming a huge amount of omega-6 fats, then direct sources are better. Although there's no RNI for these amounts. But the diet, diet daily recommended value for EPA and DHA is around 2.2 grams a day. So the best, best sources is the oily fish. So oily fish, mackerel, sardines, trout, herring, kippers, mackerel, uh, and salmon. Um, but we're advised, well, women of childbearing age are advised not to have more than two portions a week and the rest of us no more than four portions a week. And that's because these oily fish may cause high levels of mercury, dioxins and PC, uh, PCBs, which can be harmful to the body. Free range eggs can provide us with um, good sources of the omega-3. It's better if the uh, hens are left to run the pastures and eat the natural uh, foods by pecking at the bugs and, and grass. Uh, and these provide more of the omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, for vegetarians or vegans, they could get the active EPA and DHA from having algae or algae oil or seaweed. Good sources are also in walnuts, chai seeds and milk flaxseed. However, this is the ALA that is provided and not the active components of the EPA and DHA. So people may need to take more of these foods to actually get the active components from them. You can take a supplement for omega-3 and cod liver oil, high strength cod liver oil, a capsule provides with 0.3 grams and a dessert spoon 2.6 grams. Now the supplementation of the omega-3 has not been shown in clinical trials to reduce cardiovascular risk factors or cardiovascular disease, but it has been shown to actually reduce pain and morning stiffness associated with arthritis. Moving on to protein now. Protein is building blocks of around 20 amino acids. There's nine essential amino acids that we can't make in the body, so we need to take these in through food. And there's six conditionally essential amino acids, which means that they're not normally essential unless our requirements are increased or our diet is not providing enough of them.
And then there's five non-essential amino acids. Amino acids are vital for survival. Uh, the muscles, bones, repair, making enzymes for the immune system, for making hormones, and also the neurotransmitters. Now, protein quality is based on the ability to provide all the essential amino acids in the correct quantity. So complete protein can be found in meat, seafood, eggs, poultry, and dairy foods. If you're vegetarian or vegan, you can get complete protein from soya, but you should really perhaps have the organic soya, as there's lots of genetic engineered soya around. Quinoa and also buckwheat. So how much of each essential amino acid do we need and how can we get it? So here I provided the recommended daily amount for adults per kilogram. So for a 70 gram kilogram adult, then these are the requirements for each of the essential amino acids. You can see here that the animal foods, two eggs and 100 grams of lamb, provide around 50 or 60% of the requirements for each essential amino acid. At the right hand side here, you can see that soybeans do provide um, around a third to 40% of the um, essential amino acids. So more soy would have to be eaten to get the uh, daily requirement. Moving on now to the vitamins. So vitamin A, we need um, it for functioning of the major organs, vision, immune health, and also it's a potent antioxidant. Animal sources are more bioavailable, but you can also get it from the plant sources that need then to be converted to the bioavailable source. And this um, uh, conversion is often quite inefficient. Because it's a fat soluble vitamin, it needs to be absorbed with fat. Deficiency can cause blindness. Good sources are liver, carrots, herring, and eggs. Vitamin B1. So we need this for regulation of the metabolism, brain functioning, energy production, and the conversion of the amino acid tryptophan into serotonin. So deficiency can result in beriberi, often unheard of nowadays, especially in developed countries, but also neurological symptoms as well. And it's thought it may be one of the causes of, um, or the deficiency may be one of the causes of Alzheimer's disease. Good sources are pork, pecan nuts, mussels and sunflower seeds. Vitamin B2, the function is for energy production, detoxification and control of homocysteine levels. If these become too high, then it can increase risk of cardiovascular disease. Deficiency is rare, but if people have a poor diet or are abusing alcohol, then deficiency is more common. And this can cause skin and eye problems, sore throat, swollen tongue and anemia. So sources, nuts like almonds, eggs, beef steak, chicken, kale. Vitamin B3 needed to convert food into energy, optimum gland and liver function, production of enzymes and coenzymes, for example, NAD, which helps uh, more than 400 enzymes to activate body processes. Deficiency, rare nowadays, but if people are deficient and just slightly deficient, it may cause premature aging, dementia, and dry and cracked lips. So sources, again, from real foods, beef liver, haddock, kidney beans, and spinach.
Vitamin B5. Function is that tissues and organs can work correctly. And in the production of red blood cells, cholesterol, reproductive and stress hormones, brain neurotransmitters um, that help with the muscle contractions. Deficiency can be lead to generally fatigue and malaise and numbness and tingling in the lower extremities. Again, real food sources, chicken liver, eggs again, peanut butter, natural yogurt. Vitamin B6. So the function is that it's a coenzyme involved in more than 140 biochemical reactions. It may help uh, premenstrual tension. It may uh, it helps with the hemoglobin formation, neurotransmitter synthesis, and also in the immune system. Deficiency, although rare, it can cause seizures rash, confusion, depression, anemia, and inflammation of the lip and tongues, tongue. Sources, tuna, salmon, chickpeas, and pork chops is for examples. Vitamin B7, which is also known as biotin. So in the production, the function is for the production of energy, healthy hair, and nails. Deficiency rare, but it can cause fatigue, insomnia, dry and scaly skin, and hair loss. Good sources, lamb's liver, eggs, salmon, and cheddar cheese. So folic acid, vitamin B9, increased requirement in pregnancy, and that's because it's formation of the spine in babies helps in brain and heart health and improves mood. Deficiency can cause anemia, fatigue, irritability, cognitive impairment and shortness of breath. Good sources, beef liver, spinach, avocado and green beans. Vitamin B12. So important function, fatty acid synthesis, energy production, DNA synthesis and the coating of the myelin sheath so every cell in the body needs it. It can be made by bacteria in the gut but it's made in the large intestine and we can only absorb it in the small intestine. So basically any that we do make we tend to excrete from the body. So that's why it's an essential nutrient and we need to take it into our diet. Deficiency can lead to fatigue, weakness, confusion, constipation, and depression. Sources is only available in animal products. So good examples of beef liver, clams, trout, and cheddar cheese. So certainly vegans and probably also vegetarians will need to take a supplement. Vitamin C. So the RNI for an adult is only 40 milligrams per day. However, there's emerging evidence that supplementation is beneficial, especially with COVID-19. And um, I'd like you to, I think an excellent podcast or uh, interview is with Steve Bennett interviewing Patrick Holford. And he's, talk, he's talking about, Patrick's talking about his work and his research in the, um, the fact that vitamin C is a fantastic antiviral properties and that uh, we should be perhaps taking at least a thousand uh, milligrams a day or one gram a day. So I do recommend that you listen to the uh, YouTube video with uh, Patrick Holford and also uh, Steve Bennett. It can be synthesized in almost all mammals except humans so we can't make vitamin C. The function is that it helps to build and repair tissues, so it's in a healing process. It helps to fight infections, so it's needed in the immune system, and also in the formation of collagen and antioxidants. 
Now, deficiency was known through scurvy uh, when blood levels dropped to less than 300 milligrams. Good sources, we've got the uh, red peppers, the kale, the strawberries, the lemon, and also you can have a small amount in chicken livers. Another vital vitamin, vitamin D. So uh, the reference nutrient intake for adults is 10 micrograms a day. And it's actually, we call it a vitamin, but it's actually a hormone that is synthesized with the skin, it's absor absorbed to sunlight. Its function is that it helps the body to absorb calcium, regulates immune response, and may improve mood and control the appetite. Deficiency is more commonly experienced in people with dark, darker skins because they absorb less from the sunlight, and people who live in northern latitudes. And it can cause symptoms of fatigue, low immunity, bone pain, and poor healing. Sources, dietary sources involve salmon, sardines, so the fatty fish, the eggs, cheese, mushrooms, some mushrooms. But the UK government recommend that we do supplement throughout the winter uh, at 400 international units a day. Vitamin E functions as an antioxidant, it boosts, boosts the immune cells, and it's anti-inflammatory. It protects age-related eye deterioration, and it signals transmissions between cells. Deficiency can lead to a blunted immune system, nerve and muscle impairment, and vision impairment. So we've got some good sources here, clarified butter, which is known as ghee, eggs, double cream, broccoli, walnuts, and salmon. And finally, vitamins K, K1, and K2. We often class K2 as a forgotten vitamin. So we have a reference nutrient intake for K1, but not for K2. And it's suggested that we should have 200 micrograms a day for K2. We can make a small amount by the bacteria in the gut. These vitamins are fat soluble. And the function of K1 is blood, blood clotting. And for K2, it prevents the calcification of blood vessels. Deficiency can lead to bruising, bleeding, and excessive, uh, and ost also um, osteoprenia. So the sources of K1 is in kale collards and Brussels sprouts, the green leafy veg, and K2, the high fat dairy products, cheese, egg yolks, liver, and also fermented foods such as sauerkraut and kimchi. I haven't got time to go into all the minerals, but here I've provided a table that you can browse through in your own time, where I've listed all the essential minerals why they're needed and good food sources. So there's calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, potassium, sodium, chloride, zinc, selenium, chromium, manganese, iodine, copper, um, and so on. And the final one is choline, which isn't a mineral, but is still essential nutrient uh, when you can get from liver, eggs, cod, salmon, cauliflower, and broccoli. So I hope I've provided a good case for the fact that we can obtain our essential nutrients by consuming real food. Thank you for your attention.